Okay, so the first item is Michelle is asking me to share my screen. Um, I think people know this, but we'll see. Um, we have a new map in town of districts. Um, and can, can everyone see the screen right now? I can see it, yeah. Yep, okay. So um, let me just see if I can minimize this for a second. So if I, if I do it for starters, um, we don't have precinct one and precinct three anymore. We're now precinct one and pre, one A and one B, and just people will have to think of one B as being the old precinct three. But the big change, um, and Nancy Sardinson, I can see you're right on the edge of some of these, but there's, we picked up a part of North Amherst that we didn't have before on the screen right in this area. So, so we, we will be, the town will be mailing out information to people on where their polling site is um, because of these shifts in the district borders. For us, the where we vote has not changed. So everyone who's in what used to be precinct one um, will still vote at the North Congregational Church and everyone who's in precinct three will still vote at um, the Emmanuel Lutheran Church. And I don't know whether, um, I'm just gonna stop there. This is actually the, the town clerk has revised this to show where everybody's polling places are. We made, we voted on that on the council on Monday night. And the one, one change that doesn't affect us, but it affects people in Lynn, in district two, and Lynn is on the phone. Um, there, Wildwood used to be a polling site. And instead of Wildwood being a polling site, since there's no bus route to it, the Wild, Wildwood will be voting at the Amherst Regional High School, as will three other of these precincts. Um, everyone who lives right near the Bang Center, the Ann Whalen House and the um, Scroll, this whole area, which is Amherst College, Ann Whalen will be voting at the Bang Center. And then when you get to the South, the Munson Library and the Crocker Farm School. Again, all of these, if you see B, it's what used to have another number. And we decided there was a decision that it was confusing to people because the old precinct numbers didn't go with the district numbers that we just would go ahead and change it. So I'm gonna leave this up, but just see if anyone has any questions, comments, when will you know what kinds of um, information on this? and just raise your hand or we're a pretty small group, just talk. I don't, I don't see any, right? Okay. I'm not seeing any. You know, so what, what we will try to do um, is um, one of the things uh, the donor group, the neighborhood association group had started to do was some sort of block parties, some picnics that they would host in different neighborhoods and also try to get out the word to the voters where they're going to be voting. Um, so doing that over the summer when we can go back to outdoor meetings. Um, but right now that is about all the information we have on the, the new voting there will be, um, to the extent people really want to know, or you got asked, am I still in District 1 or not, the, the um, booklets that the town puts out, which lists every street and everybody's uh, address, will be available within the next couple months. So we will have those as well. Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I'll move on then to North Amherst updates. And we have... Um, a few. So starting with the East Pleasant Street survey, a contract has been signed and the survey is going to go from Olympia Drive to Pine um, for new sidewalks. And we understand it will take 12 weeks. And um, Paul says that the survey will help to establish the scope of uh, for construction, as well as the impact on neighboring properties. Um, and they hope to be able to also get some sort of budget information out of that as well. So um, it will take some time, but it is in process. And then we have the North Amherst Library. It's our understanding that bids will be reviewed with the architect this week. I think there was a, a bit of a delay on getting the bids, but um, that will be happening this week. And then we have two Amherst-specific um, 
CPAC awards were given to the pickleball courts, um, which are going into Mill River. And then um, the donor group put forward um, a proposal for the Mill River History Walk, and that was also approved. So those are two great um, updates um, as far as CPAC is concerned. Kathy, did I miss anything? No, I just, you might wanna, um, on the on the pickleball courts, and Lynn is on here, and I know um, her husband is a pickleball player, as are several people in town. The proposal was to put them in at Mill River. It has been approved as uh, pickleball courts in Amherst, but the what I heard verbally, um, not so much by Sarah Marshall, who is the chair of CPAC, but from Dave Zomack, is there still will be a decision on where they go. So I think those of us who would really like them up in at Mill River should continue to advocate for that site. And for those of you who know the recreation area, the, the proposed location of them was as you come down the driveway, the entranceway into the recreation area, there's a small parking lot off to the left, it's outside of the basketball courts. And that has enough space for two to three pickleball courts. So, and, and it's already paved over, which was one of the advantages of it. So if you put courts on it, we're not adding pavement to grass anywhere. So it was was an attractive site for that reason. So it's just that I don't know when that decision will be made. And um, sometimes uh, things get approved and it takes a long time till, till they happen. And we don't always know in advance. So we'll try to at least keep tracking that. Okay, I'm admitting Meg is joining us. I now. was just gonna say, I think I had a feeling someone might be there. Yeah. Great, great. Welcome, Meg. You know, Meg, we just we just did a quick announcement on the CPAC awards, and you might want to say a word or two about the award for the history walk, um, if you're if you're able. Yep, I'm able. I'm just unmuting, and I'm. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. I'm going to start my video, and I'm going to walk somewhere where I'm not bothering anybody. <laughs> And Meg, we'll bring you back also if you're if you're still here toward the end, just to give an right. overall donut update. But um, given that we're just talking about this now, it would be great to right. hear about that. So I apologize for not getting on right at 1.30. We're in Delaware right now. So I'm just gonna move to where I can be, have, won't bother anybody. So we were delighted that our proposal for the um, Miller was funded by CPAC with $12,900. And this is gonna enable us to hire an architect who will do the preliminary research on the uh, cellar holes and some of the uh, remaining remnants of the many mills that were on the Mill River. The, uh, the uh, goal of the project in the end is to create an interpretive trail that goes from the <clears throat> uh, Mill River Recreation Park to the Cushman Common. So it gets a little bit into district two. I see Lynn is here. Um, and it'll have an interpretive signs and a link to through a QR codes to a website. And uh, a lot of people aren't aware of the history. There were <clears throat> dozens and dozens of mills along the Mill River <clears throat> um, from early colonial time until the early 20th century. In 1775, there were six already. So this is an exciting project. We're creating a... <clears throat> Oh, I just ran up the stairs too fast. <laughs> um, um, <laughs> gonna catch my breath here. Um, we're creating a neighborhood. We're doing this in the, in the style of this, in the tradition of community archeology, span which involves the community and overseeing and managing and, and monitoring historic sites um, and um, we're creating a neighborhood committee. If you know anyone who wants to be on it or if any of you want to, uh, we should probably have someone from District 2 since we're gonna touch District 2 when we get to the Cushman Common. A lot of the best, the most uh, interesting sites are between Cushman Common and Puffers. Um, so we're creating a neighborhood committee. It'll meet probably once a month. David Mix Barrington is chairing the committee and uh, he'll be, uh, he lives on Pine Street. He'll be um, managing that neighborhood process. And this neighborhood committee will keep going 
uh, permanently as we, you know, as we, is this part of North Amherst culture, there'll be this ability for people to participate in the, the trail. Mm -hmm. The four sites that we're going to look at this first time are uh, the dam and canal at the Mill River Park. So if you're at the Mill River Park and you're at the basketball court, if you look north, you'll see a big hill, like a, and that's the canal that used to take the water up to the grist mill. We're also looking at the Cushman Clam Club, which is just to the east of Cushman Common, which was a men's club. And there's still a midden of clamshells that you can see. And the two Roberts Mills that are just uh, before the ramp on both sides of the Robert Francis Bridge. So very exciting. Yeah, congratulations. And it took perseverance. Um, sure you know, <laughs> we're going to we're going to feature, and we're gonna, I think we will be shifting back to the later Sunday afternoon just to feature this, but the CPAC definitely is trying to solicit and be welcoming to community um, proposals, even though they make it extremely difficult to get to yes. Um, but we're gonna be featuring, Sam McLeod would like to come on, so probably at the next district meeting, just on what it takes to make a proposal, what kinds of things they're, they're interested in um, beyond what has been funded. So I think that's it, uh, Michelle, for announcements. And yep, I guess I think you're right. So um, just, uh, I guess, moving in, you can go ahead, uh, Kath, and move right into the school building project update that you have. Okay, so I was going to do, I'm chair of the school building committee, and at least one person, meaning Tony, has been to, I think, virtually every one of our meetings well before we had a designer and others on board and has been following this for years. Um, so I'm gonna be showing just a few slides of where we are and I'll try to be super brief because what I'd like to do is come back to this in, if we do another district meeting in May or in early June, when we're gonna be further along with some decisions. Um, it, but it basically, let me get my, uh, let me sure I can. From the beginning. Is that showing up on everybody's screen? You know, so for those who, of you who have not been following this um, every minute of the time, uh, as some of us have, we are in the midst of talking about a new elementary school, and this would be either a renovation with an addition or a brand new building. Um, that would be would have several features that I've listed here, including daylight filled classrooms and outdoor space for education. But it will also be the first large public building built in Amherst under our net zero bylaw, which I'll describe a little bit more what that means. But basically, we're moving away from fossil fuels, that um, it would be an all electric building, well insulated, energy efficient. And then we'll use photovoltaic panels to generate renewal energy that will literally should reduce our utility budget to very little or nothing. We are where the school committee voted a while ago to move the sixth grade up to the middle school. So the school that's being talked about will consolidate two schools, Wildwood and Fort River, and it will be grades K through five for around 575 students. The location of those is still up for grabs. It's going to be either at Wild River or Fort River. And we're working with a granting authority called the Massachusetts School Building Committee. Um, the and that actually dictates our schedule a lot. We have to work around what they require for each step when they're meeting. Um, we are it, where we are in the process is we submitted a preliminary design program, which said, what are we going to study in the next phase? And the school committee came, uh, did an education plan, an education program, which also dictated directly influence the space allocation. How many classrooms do we need? A gym, where are special education kids going? And that space summary then determines the size of the building. So all of that had to happen to be able to do cost estimates. The phase we're in right now that we're hoping to finish by the end of June is going from four choices, Wildwood or Fort River, new, new 
or new ad renovated down to one choice or preferred choice. And with that, we would have new estimates that will have to be approved by the granting authority before we can move from that stage to really designing the building and figuring out exactly what the costs are gonna be. Right now, this is scheduled um, because the school is expensive. Once we're through that, it would come to the council and the council would determine how it's financed, but we're expecting this would be a debt exclusion override vote, a debt exclusion vote by the voters in town. Um, we don't have enough internal ref resources to fund the entire share of the Amherst share of the project. So the a point that's not funded by the grant. Um, as I mentioned right at the beginning, we finished the preliminary design program. We're moving into this preferred design, choosing of a site, and we're hoping to get all of this done in time to get it to the MSBA. So it's a tight deadline um, by the end of June. A few things about the building, and then I'll show you a, a few pictures. Um, any, any site or any way of building, whether it's new or ad reno, will will include certain features. Um, the classroom and program spaces have to meet the educational program. So we're building to a certain size of classroom space. Every classroom will have daylight in it. We will have educate outdoor space for both playing and education, you know, moving to study the out of doors, but also have classes outside. There will be a safe way to to enter the building, to drop off children with traffic plans, and it will be ADA accessible. And we're planning for a design of the building that allows community use after hours, which means secure entry that not to the whole building, but to parts of the building. And one notable thing about this building is it will have a what's called a cafetorium. It's gonna have a stage in it. And the new buildings that I've seen with these are gorgeous. So we expect this to be a real resource to the town for small performances during the summer, as well as after hours. As I said at the beginning, we're building a net zero school. It's sustainable, which means it will be extremely well insulated with user zones. So we won't have to heat and air condition parts of the building that we're not using at any time. It will be all electric, no fossil fuels, and there'll be on-site PV solar panels that will generate enough real renewable energy to offset the electric use. Um, we see those of us who are super excited about this for climate action and for the aspects of the building is that this building is going to provide a real opportunity for the kids in town, as well as all of us to think about climate and learn about what we can do in the few schools that have been built like this. And there are several across the country. They talk about the excitement in town and visitors come to the town, but the kids come home um, and one beautiful, wonderful video as the mother said, our child is coming home, our third grader is coming home, and they're unplugging devices all over the house and turning off the lights all the time, telling us we're wasting energy. And then they come home excited on how much energy the sun generated because they have dashboards in the school. So it's a real learning opportunity for kids. And given what we're spending now on these two buildings, we're gonna save well more than $250,000 a year in heating, electrical, um, our schools, work off of coal, oil, not coal, but oil and gas right now. So it may be more than that if you think of the escalation in prices. I'm gonna go just quickly through a couple pictures we just saw on Friday, and I'm speeding through these because there's no decisions being made. But as I said earlier, we have to choose where is the school going to be built and whether it will be an addition renovation or brand new. So what the designer is doing for us is saying, what might a two story, what might a three story look like? Um, we don't specifically have to make that decision, but we are likely to because it influences the cost of the building for the next round of cost estimates. But it's to be able to look at them in the context of either of the two sites. So to be able to think of where the building might sit on the site and what does that look like. There are clearly a lot of other issues on choosing the site on the traffic patterns getting on and off of the property, how much space there is for play space, um, water table levels, fields. So um, I'm zipping through this one, but one of the things they've showed us is that they have to think of where the hallways are. <laughs> 
and where the community spaces are. So in in this, the designs they're showing us, they color coded these where classrooms are always some sort of a blue and the shared spaces like the cafeteria um, the gym or the um, uh, or the library are not blue. So there's something there's some other color and then they've done designs on here's a possible way the three floors might lay out to give us a sense of what this would be and we're going to be doing a lot of this over the summer once we choose the site because the groups that are, will be involved in this are the kids in the schools now the teachers in the school the staff and community members thinking of how you enter the building where is the gym where's the cafeteria and what they've done in terms of showing us this, um, I'm hopefully everyone can see this as I flip through them, is sort of with a three story building, one of the advantages and what they're seeking to do is the kids stay in the school while they're building. So we're not going to be moving children. And that means they need enough space on the site to build next to the existing school. And you can kind of see the little black outline of the existing school right in here on Fort River or over here on Wildwood. So there's a just enough space to build another school there while the existing school. So they would build the school and then take down the school. This designer said they built like this on a very tight site with eight feet of space between the old school and the new school. Then they took it down and recreated. And I saw this one. What they recreated was green fields for people to play on, you know, so whatever was there before. So they're looking at where does the driveway come in? Where's the parking lot if it's three floors? Then that was, uh, there are a couple different designs they've given for three score. This one is just a little bit different on where you enter. So it's giving us a sense of what would three stories look like. Two stories takes more space on the ground because um, we have to fit the same number of classrooms in it. So you have to think of a first floor and a second floor. And here's one possible design that they were looking at. How would that fit if you did two stories? With Wildwood being a tighter site, they really have to manipulate it around. And one of the other things, um, I'm going to go on more than maybe people want me to, but I'm totally into this. <laughs> so is what they're thinking of the sun north being north south, they'd like to keep the orientation of the building that way, but they have to work with the site and on Wildwood, they have uh, Fort River, they have to worry about where the water planes are. And on Wildwood, they have to worry about there's a hill right here, you know, so they can't just build down into this field, so they have to fit it in. So two stories fits better if you look at this at Fort River than it does at Wildwood, but they're just showing us these pictures right now without making judgments. When they're looking at the renovation in addition um, to an existing building, this is what the existing building looks like. This entire middle section has no windows. It's a great big building of 80,000 square feet. So the windows are around this to the extent, not at the gym on the outside edge. So what they've come up with is narrowing out, hollowing out this, and their design has a, a green area in the middle so that the classrooms can be all around this in here. And then the new addition would be attached to the renovated addition. And somehow, but I haven't heard exactly how they, they have a plan to do this again while the building is occupied. So to be a first floor and a second floor of a new addition, and the way this looks on a site where you don't get to see all that nice first floor and second floor, this is the old and this is the new. And so that's on the Fort River site and this is on the Wildwood site. And one of the things you can see on this is they, there's no choice anymore of north south orientation. You have to live with whatever the building is. Um, so this is all in, in the works right now and we're, being asked as a building committee to make a decision on both the preferred place we're building and the preferred method, new or ad reno. So this is a very long and we can, anyone who wants to see all these dates, I can send them to you. We're meeting every two weeks. Um, as I mentioned early, there's a community, community forum scheduled for May 5th. 
which will be well before we make a decision. When I say well, on, and the time zones we're in, it's well. We will be near to a decision by the beginning of June, and we'll be doing a community forum before we make a decision. And this was one of the things we assured people is that we would provide information well in advance before final decisions were made. So participation is really important, get people to come to these meetings. Um, the community forum, particularly if you have views on either site or uh, ways of doing it. So we're meeting every two weeks. We're hoping by this end date in June that we will know enough as a committee that we'll be able to vote and uh, we've got a series of criteria on a plus and minus on different options or advantages, disadvantages. And we'll have cost estimates, new cost estimates based on um, all of what I've just described, including what is uh, the building envelope, the actual structure, for, including whatever HIVAC system we choose, whether we're either going with ground source or air source heat pumps. And I'm going to stop there um, because uh, it was a whirlwind to, to uh, and Hilda said she had to leave. So I'm, I'm gonna try to do this again, Michelle. I mean, we can figure out when we went scale a district meeting because we'd like to get this out to the districts, not just do a community forum on news. We're nearing that initial decision, which will then drive the design of the building. Um, on where we're building it and how we're building it, whether it's add new. And these are not the only drawings they're doing. They're trying to update the testing of the soil, uh, traffic patterns, looking at what they can fit on these sites, and they will be updating all the costs. And if we do decide to have our next meeting in person somewhere, which we hope to be able to do, um, potentially, right, um, we'll have to be able to get um, some sort of screen or something like that, that you can take people through this again. Well, and I, and I think, Michelle, in the next one, we'll be down to enough information. We can say, here's our two or three main comparisons with some looks really good here, looks not as good here. So we can do something, a simple poster, maybe to just to, to let people um, do as a visual. So I, I know um, Kathleen, you had uh, written in about um, how much is all of this gonna cost? Uh, she, Kathleen had written me with some questions about taxes, as well as where's the ARPA money going? Um, and we are not prepared to talk about any of that today because we won't really know what the Amherst share of the school is until uh, late in this year. Um, we first have to get up with the final cost, then the granting authority tells us. And at the finance committee level, hi, we have we have someone who cares about this school is in one of these schools. <laughs> and you know, one, one, for, for, for those who, people who aren't listening, one of the really interesting comments on the principal of one of these schools who had visited a three-story school, one of her comments is, we're living right now in these enormous schools that are half empty because of the enrollment drop. And then with COVID, we've split up and made walls. So when you visit some of these classrooms, they have living room space, they have project space, they have children's space. So looking at normal classrooms to her was, my goodness, <laughs> they're, they're not, they're in 2000 square feet for 12 kids in some of these classrooms. So, and we're talking about a lot of space right now. But um, so, so some of this will be um, decided, costs will not be the only factor, but we need a final cost estimate over the summer and into the fall before the granting authority tells us what their share what they will do. And that will tell us what we need to do from either internal financing of money we've got in reserves and the finance committee will be looking at modeling this again um, as uh, before we discuss to what extent, what we will go out to the community for, for debt exclusion. And I, I think I'll just stop there because we I can't give any update on that information. Just on uh, Kathleen, on your questions more generally, the finance committee 
is starting to meet tonight's April, beginning of May, we will be meeting on every department because um, the budgets for 2023, the next coming year are coming in. Um, we know already what the tax revenue will be, the property tax revenue. We will get new news. Those are being regularly updated on what the retail commercial revenue is, but the town is living off of very tight budgets because most of our money comes in from the property tax. Um, we, we do not have a lot of commercial revenue coming in um, and there's less than it used to be. And although we've been helped out a lot with ARPA funds and federal and special state grants, a few years down the road, those, those funding sources aren't gonna be available either. So we're, we're looking across the board on a multiple year level on um, issues of affordability across the town. And I'm going to stop talking because I know Kathleen, <laughs> Kathleen, you wrote me a, a series of questions and people should just jump in and Meg's hand is going up too. Yeah. Um, and it was on questions. So Meg's hand is up, Handy's, Tony's hand is up. So Meg, did you want to jump in and yeah. then talk? Just quickly, Kathy, thank you for that report. It was not too long. And I want to thank you and everyone on the committee for how hard you're working. And I urge everyone to encourage people to pay attention right now, between now and May, because the people get, this is, has been a sort of a third rail issue in Amherst and it doesn't have to be. People need to pay attention now, early while these decisions, before these decisions have been made. And we, all of us who care about this process as well as the outcome need to do everything we can to encourage people to go to these meetings, participate, give their input, uh, because if it comes later, it's it's so much harder and it feels uh, unhelpful once preliminary decisions have been made. And the committee has done an amazing job of trying to get input. Uh, and we just need to think more deeply about how to make sure everybody's paying attention right now to uh, this process. And I have this list of my particular excitement is in whichever location isn't picked that we could have a new senior center, preschool, and maybe a teen center, which I think are three constituencies that are really good together. Uh, and it's sort of embarrassing how awful our senior center situation is in Amherst. And I know that's not helpful to raise that right now when we have so many other costs, but uh, it's really time for us to think more deeply. So I'm excited about what might be possible with the site that's left um, in terms of seniors, preschool, and teens. You know, I'm just, I'm going to let Tony talk, but on the site that's left, um, the <laughs> guy named, a guy named Tim is the one who's been doing a lot of work to look at our current state of the buildings and the current state of the site. And in one of, in one, as he was reporting on this at some point, I said, so Tim, is one of these buildings in better shape if we were going to say, let's keep the one that's in better shape? And he said, what do you mean? I said, well, one of them is going to be empty. And he said, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> he said, remember, if you whatever you're going to want to use them for, you're going to have to do some work on them. And the issue is um, most of the systems, the, the write up of them referred to the HIVAC systems, the electrical and plumbing as vintage which was an interesting term and that it's, they hadn't seen any like that for quite some time. And that our crews have been, our crews have been amazing that they've kept them going, you know? So it's, it's not that you have to tear the building down, but it's just that, that there is a, there's a need for, for some not um, in, unsubstantial money to, uh, to do, whichever building, it's not like one is better or worse on that. And they're identical in terms of the layout. So, so Tony. Hi, yeah, thank you. Um, thanks for raising that, Meg. I couldn't agree more on, on the need to think now about what we could use an 82,000 square foot building for. And actually my child who you saw, she is in one of those 2000 square feet rooms right now. I think there's 16 other kids in her class and two full-time teachers in the class. So I feel like she's getting a private school education for free. Um, and they have done a lot of renovations already to the buildings because of COVID. So they did put up full walls to separate those rooms. 
and doors. The doors look like solid wooden doors and there's natural light in all those spaces. So we have 12 2000 square foot spaces ready to go for another use. Um, totally agree with Kathy that we would need to replace the HVAC system in whichever building is remains and ideally get it off fossil fuels. So I think that's something that the town is looking at for every town owned building. The police station, they're looking at moving to VRF and I'm sure um, whichever building remains, that should be a JCPC, um, part of the JCPC plan to get them off fossil fuels. Um, I know the Fort River roof is in worse condition. It needs replaced right away. Um, I think there's less or fewer leaks in the Wildwood building right now. But um, I thank you, Kathy. I echo some of Meg's comments to um, appreciating the committee and the thoroughness. And I know you are working so many hours for free on this. So I really appreciate that. Um, I just wanted to, to say, Kathy, I've really appreciated in the past how you always think beyond the project itself. Like I know when, when um, downtown development projects come up, you're always asking like, well, what are the town costs that may be triggered from this? Is there gonna be a bus stop needed? Is there gonna be new water infrastructure or any other impacts of a project? And so I think it's important for everybody to understand that these sites have other impacts. And for example, the traffic study indicated that Wildwood would probably need a second driveway and entrance, um, and it may not be uh, viable because of cost. Um, there is a backing up on Strong Street and a backing up at the entrance. There could be a knock-on impact of a need to improve the intersection with East Pleasant and Strong Street, whether that's a roundabout or uh, signalized, that's a cost that needs to be built into. And then uh, you mentioned the water at Fort River. The geotechnical also out found water at Wildwood two to five feet down. And it has the same soil challenges that Fort River has as far as fill. They put in like temporary, not temporary, but soil that you can't put a two or three story building on at both sites. So, so both sites have a lot of the same soil and water issues um, that will add cost. And as far as the climate stuff goes, I know, um, geothermal definitely the ground source uh, wells definitely lower the energy of the building so I, I think if we can in any way the town should strive to for ground source and it looks like Fort River has a lot more space for that than Wildwood um, as Kathy mentioned Wildwood is a very tight site and the limitations on the space mean you really can't go to two-story as, as Kathy showed it's like a t-shaped building to make it fit Whereas at Fort River, there's a lot more room that you could put a two-story building with the correct orientation. And then just on the uh, green space and the play space for kids, like right now, um, obviously with the pandemic, we really value the kids being able to be outside. We don't know what the future holds. We may need space for outdoor learning. And Fort River has acres and acres of outdoor space. Whereas as you saw from the drawing on Wildwood, it's pretty cramped. There, I don't know how many outdoor classrooms could be accommodated on that space at the one time. Um, so from what I've seen so far, I came into this with an open mind, but from what I've seen so far, Fort River to me looks like a better site for the school. And then thinking about if that was the case, Wildwood would be the leftover site and, and all those ideas that Meg suggested seems like a good fit. For example, if you had a BIPOC youth center at Wildwood, the middle and high school kids could just walk up the hill um, after school. You could have intergenerational programming, which I know the senior center is striving to develop and then there's a there's a community action um, head start right on the Wildwood campus already, um, so it's it's a complementary you know use there. So um, the other thing was the two and three story. Um, like I said, Wildwood seems like it's going to force a three story choice. Whereas if two story, I don't know what the pros and cons are. It seems like two story would be easier access to outdoors, a larger roof area for PV. And um, perhaps Fort River is preferable in that way too, because it gives you that choice. Um, so yeah, they're just some of my comments. Thank you. Uh, Kathy, thank you right? Yeah, thank you, Tony. That was really helpful. You, can I follow up on with a, can I ask you a question, Kathy, as a follow-up? Oh, Tony? absolutely. No, ask questions and, um, you know, just, just one assurance that the types of things that Tony just mentioned in terms of, costs that are related to any decision, those are gonna be priced out. Um, so, you know, to the extent um, there is a somewhat of an issue at Fort River, not as, as much of an issue on the exit out of Fort River is really near the intersection right now. So, you know, on a uh, left-hand turn. So that looking at things like that, do we need a different signal and Fort River building up the foundation 
Um, so the estimators and the designers are trying to address, to help us make the decision by building up it's, do we want it to be more expensive? No, but if there are related costs, we need to be looking at all of them um, when, we're, when we're making this decision. So those will be part of this next round of cost estimates. So Michelle, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, just to follow up on that and just for clarification. So it's the building committee that will vote on where the site will be. Is that right? Okay. Yes. And then is there some criteria that is, you know, already been established in terms of how that decision will be made? And I know you're doing a lot of community outreach, but what are the ways that as people are following along as like Tony has sort of come up with her own ideas based on what she's seen? What are the ways that community members might be able to provide other than, you know, is it sending an email to you as the chair or, um, but more, more I, I'd like to understand like what criteria is going to be used to make that final decision by the committee? An excellent question. We have a criteria, it's called an evaluate, evaluation criteria matrix that was uh, a, a draft of it came from the designer really early on and we're looking at it um, to make sure, um, and that first draft, re redraft you saw, Tony, is not at all final. We're, Phoebe and I are gonna go back and look at it. We were trying to avoid duplication on rows and we realized some things got knocked off that shouldn't have, but we're trying to set up things that would allow you to say, this is a bit better on this. And all four are viable. Okay, so we eliminated a couple that look like they don't work, period. So now all four of these new either site add reno either side are viable choices for us. So they're not bad choices. So now we have to, is this one a bit better? Are they about the same? Is this one a little worse? So we've got criteria like the traffic entry and movement on and off, um, the availability of outdoor space to play and green space. Uh, and, you know, a few others that will allow you to do a, um, you know, if you color coded green is looks really good, you know, uh, white is not better or worse and uh, orange is a little less good, you know, kind of looking at it. And then it's going to be uh, there are 13 people on the committee um, at some point we will have to vote because at this point, I don't think anything is going to come out with all all positives and all less good, it's gonna be on the one hand and on the other hand kinds of issues. Uh, the price tag will matter. Um, we're very conscious of trying to make a cost-effective decision, but, and just to give you some of the trade-offs here with, um, with ad reno, um, you, you have less choice of where to orient the building and you have to do a bigger, envelope for the building, the way you saw that outside rim, which makes it inherently less energy efficient, not because of any fault. So it needs more of, and name whatever the more of, to heat and air conditioning it, and then the PV system to offset those costs. So we're going to have all of that information to look at. Um, and then weighing in, I think we will be well, hopefully it's the beginning of May. By the, by the beginning of May, it's the beginning of April, by the beginning of May, that matrix will have stopped moving and we will have started to fill it out. So that May 5th meeting, you're gonna be some, seeing some of this. And then between that and the June community meeting, we will be filling out more of that. And I think we'll figure out a way to get information out, push it out on a more frequent basis. This is, we meet Friday mornings from 8.30 to 10.30 and all the meetings are on Zoom, um, but it, we shouldn't be asking people to hang out for a two hour meeting to wait to do comments at the end of it as the only way of getting comments in. Mm -hmm. So we will be looking for how do we get additional input. Oh. And just for the others who, are on the call who don't know the composition. We have principals of both schools on the committee. 
Um, we have a school committee member. We have the maintenance staff, the facility director. So we have people that know these buildings and these sites really well. Um, uh, and the superintendents on it. And then we have our finance director and town manager and two counselors and th three other people on who have kids in the schools, you know, and to our architects. So we have a nice mix of people in terms of um, two of our, two of our members have children in two of the schools. So it's a, you know, a, a interesting perspective where one has the, one Crocker and one Fort River, the other is one Waldwood and one Fort River. So that will be a, a, a perspective, but this choice um, to me feels uh, uh, a lot of weight on my shoulders is one way of doing it, a lot of responsibility. And I would like to make as informed a decision both by what the outside world thinks as well as the information we have. So it's a terrific question. It's my personal preference is I'd like to make, I would, I would not want to have a decision that 15 years from now, people said, actually with Waldron and Fort River, they said it two years later, why did you build this way? <laughs> you know, I mean, they literally, they, after we built school number one, people said, don't build another. And we built a second one with the same design um, for, I wasn't here as a voter then. I don't know why. I think we got a cheap architectural drawing because they're identical. You didn't have to redesign a building. Um, but but I think in informed input and Lynn will probably, I don't know Lynn whether we, we don't have time to probably schedule a council meeting before this, but the councilors are going to be aware of this too, just on people getting their views in. So we don't have just the few dedicated souls who show up every, Friday morning at 8.30. Thank you, Tony. <laughs> there are, there are, we, we, we have a group, and Tony's one of them, and Maria's one of them. They are always there, and they have come to every net zero meeting. So Tony can probably tell you as much about ground source versus air source as I can <laughs> on what these things are and why one might be better than the other or not as good as the, or they're kind of equal. Um, but but all of that um, is, is under a very condensed timeline. So... Um, and if we don't get to this point by the end of June, it's not like the sky falls down. It just means we miss an MSBA meeting and then we push the construction off by, you know, half a year. The building gets open to half a year later. You know, I mean, it's, it's that kind of, if we don't do this now, we lose time on the other end. So we're trying to stay on this tight timeline. So I just want to say that because we're using the chat function, I know some, <laughs> some districts ah. don't. Um, just some um, shout outs to you, Kathy, for your amazing leadership on this. And um, really just, uh, it's, it's a lot, it's a lot resting on you and you're doing a fantastic job. And I think we all really appreciate that. So, um, and just one little comment, if it's not in the matrix and maybe it's not, um, you know, appropriate for the matrix per se, but I think what Tony was talking about in terms of the building that's left is a really important consideration in terms of the decision itself. Um, obviously the town will decide how they're gonna use whatever, you know, is gonna be left. But uh, I think Meg made some excellent points about the possible uses. And I think that should be something that's considered. I mean, just to connect the dots that Tony talked about, you know, with students being so close and being able to access um, from the middle school or high school to the Wildwood location, for example. I mean, I think that's really important to think through not only what's the best building for the new school, but what's what are the sort of factors then with the with the space that's left. I think so too, you know, and, and I actually had that initially as one of my criteria I wanted to add, and we did have it up as a priority, and we're trying to figure out, do you, all things considered, we'd go this way or that way, and that's the tipping factor, you know, mm -hmm. on a, you know, because you don't want that to be the first factor we look at, um, so it's like, it's the tipping factor that if we're kind of on a seesaw on, on the one hand, on the other hand, and then is it uh, you know, so when we bring that in, but that it, it has come up on a regular basis um, in both directions. I mean, there's good 
things to think about on the Fort River side too, as if it was the vacant site. So it's it's just trying to, you know, in terms of access and parking spaces and community fields. Um, so so in any case, it's it's those are the pluses and minuses. I'm in. You know, Fort River has natural gas as its utility. So if we didn't completely upgrade, it runs on half the cost of a Wildwood on just the heating because one is oil and one is gas. I didn't know why it was so much cheaper. And they said, because it's gas. You know, you don't want to keep it long-term, but it's, it's they're yeah. different. They're subtle differences. So Tony. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on what Michelle said. Um, and I, I totally agree, Michelle, I think it would be great to get that uh, conversation, the potential uses of the vacated site into the prior to the decision on site, because I think it is a factor. And I agree with Kathy, like that tipping point, like if there was one site that was much better for a school, that wouldn't change that, right? That wouldn't change it. But um, I just wanted to say about the, uh, an, another piece of climate action is transportation. And so I was just my own, I love digging through data. So what I spent yesterday morning doing was going through the bus routes and how many kids live where getting on the bus and how many kids live within a half mile of each site so they can walk or bike pretty easily and it, and it was with the current routes this is um fort river and wildwood there's 19 kids within a half mile of fort river currently and 11 within a half mile of wildwood currently and i'm thinking about okay what we you know we're always looking at developing housing if we were to develop housing where would it more likely be? Um, and, and I heard Chris Brestrup say at a recent planning board meeting that they're considering a chapter 40R for the East Village, um, which would make it attractive to develop housing in that area. And if you think about the East Village, which is right next to Fort River, there's a lot of like single story commercial strips there. There's the bank on the corner, there's the, the strip with like Kelly's and and uh, so this seems like, and there's the one with the yoga studio and the North hot pot. So it seems like there could be potential for development there, housing development that may, you know, may bring in more school age children who would be able to walk to the Fort River site. And I know the Wayfinders, I, I, I asked for the um, bedroom breakdown of the Wayfinders developments. There's because the East Street School is literally across the street from Fort River and it's going to have two, three and four bedroom units, which will be affordable. So potentially there could be school-aged children living there also so it's just another factor to consider and, and as far as when to bring it in one of the early community meetings the designer um donna danisco the lead for the design firm said that uh, uh, something they learned from other projects was the future she called it the disposition of the vacated site um that the that the feedback later was it got, it got talked about too late in the process and her recommendation was talk about it early, get community engagement early, because if you wait until after you've picked the site, then it's not really a choice. It's kind of the default. Um, so yeah, just a few more points there. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Um, all right, um, Kath, would you be ready to move on if there aren't any other questions on this? Okay, <laughs> great. Um, and I, so we plan to just give quick reviews of the committees that we are on. Um, and I think Kath talked about finance already to say that we're going to be delving in, um, meeting very frequently um, this next month in May. I think it's twice a week for three hours um, to review the different departments within the budget. And um, Kath, I don't know if there's anything else to say about that particular committee right now, other than that. No, I don't, I don't think so. Um, no, As, okay. especially anything that's left to say on that is nuances and you'd have to care passionately about some sub piece of it. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'll just give a quick update on, so I chaired the governance organization and legislation committee and um, I was hoping that Hilda would be here for me to say that um, she is sponsoring, I believe you're a sponsor on the Jewish American Heritage Month um, proclamation, um, but just to point out that GOL is sort of, it's a committee that not many people come to, um, <laughs> um, if anybody, um, but it's actually a really interesting committee and um, we've been working on a lot of proclamations and resolutions and finding that it's a great way to engage community members. So um, having community sponsors 
for particular proclamations like the Juneteenth proclamation, for example, and bringing those sponsors um, in for the review of, of the proclamation. And then it sort of just gives a, a more, um, uh, a deeper and richer context for the proclamation. So um, anybody is welcome to suggest a proclamation if you find a counselor that was willing to work on it with you. Um, and like I said, Hilda is sponsoring one that's um, just coming up um, for Jewish American Heritage Month. And um, so just, just to say about that, we're also working on an equity lens review process. This is a process that GOL hopes to develop um, to be able to use across all of our um, committees and our work uh, in the town council to make sure that we're using an equity lens um, as we're reviewing and making decisions. And then I'll give a quick update on the African Heritage Reparation Assembly. Um, I'll also pop something into the chat. One of the exciting um, pieces of work that we're doing right now is um, we just uh, receive the deliverables on our African-American Black Census. Um, we partnered with the Dunahue Institute at UMass to do that. And it was very interesting information and we have some great visuals also. So I'll pop a link in into the chat for that if you'd like to take a look. Um, and it's also the most recent census data um, is available to, to see there. And we'll be using that in particular for community engagement so that we can um, identify areas where Black or African-American community members are living and um, be able to reach them as we move through this process. Kath, did you, you have a hand up? Yeah, I was just gonna say that, Michelle, that you might wanna, um, we, could, we could figure out how to get some of this out through Dona also, because in that report, the summary I saw of it what was striking is the makeup of the town of Amherst. Yeah, <laughs> I know. <laughs> out of, out of 39,000 people that the yeah. census is counting, 23,000 of them are students and 14,000 live on campus, which gives you a sense of how many don't live on campus. Um, you know, yeah. so it was just a striking update and reminder of how the, the face and composition of Amherst has changed over time. Um, and, and it, it's part of the thing that has segued into, we're starting to look at what happens in neighborhoods, um, when those, when a formerly a family house turns into a student house, um, because it was vacant and the investors bought it, but it, it was just a, a really interesting updated statistic that I hadn't seen. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And the, the Indy actually did a nice coverage of it. If you just want something quick to look at, um, Kathy is absolutely right. Out of our 39,263 residents, 23,000 are students, 16,000 living in dorms. Um, and then 9% or 3,450 residents identified themselves as black or black in combination with another race with 900 of them living on campus. So um, yeah, very, very interesting. That information came from the latest um, national census and the American um, community survey. So I'll pop the link in and, and I'll talk to Dona about that. That's a good, I think if I, we're actually working right now on a mini press release with the town to get this information out so I can forward that and they can potentially be able to get that out. Okay. Um, and just a couple more updates um, with the African Heritage Reparation Assembly. Um, we are developing a community survey right now. And this survey is going to go out um, to all community members. We're hoping to identify some stakeholders in sub communities throughout the town to be able to really get boots on the ground and get um, get get the survey out to as many people as possible. Um, and the survey is going to look at um, what people 
believe a reconciliation process should look like in the town. It's going to ask people about what they know about reparations, what they know about the historical context of anti-Black structural racism in Amherst. Um, so we're in the process of developing that and um, maybe at, a, at, the, at our next meeting, we'll be further along and be able to talk about ways to get that out. Um, I know there's a lot of surveying happening in the community right now. So, um, uh, but this is, we're, we're really excited about that. And then the last update there is um, the town council, I wanna say a month ago now, um, unanimously voted to ask the town manager to begin drafting special legislation, um, which would define reparations as a public purpose for Amherst. And this is um, to give us a legal pathway for distributing reparation benefits when that time comes and to also give the most flexibility as possible to the African heritage um, residents. So those are the updates there and maybe just pause to see if there are any questions because I know we did get a couple emails about that and then um, we could move to a rental registration update before opening things up for discussion. Maria. Hi, am I unmuted? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so uh, I'm uh, really interested um, in the survey and Michelle, if you are going to be involved with that at all, or indeed with any surveys, it's not, you, you mentioned that there may be other surveys happening. I really think it's imperative that we ask, we get demographic data on respondents so that we know who are we reaching, who is responding to this survey. So we know that we're not just getting upper middle class white people that are responding to us. I mean, I think we, I think we need at least uh, race, age, and um, some marker of socioeconomic status to, to be sure who are we reaching. And if we're not doing a good enough job reaching a broad uh, swath of our community, I think we need to you know, question the validity of the survey, but more importantly, do better to fix that. Thank you. Thank you so much for bringing that up. Absolutely. Um, we plan on um, sort of the, the beginning of the survey will ask for basic demographic information for people who are willing to share it. Um, but one of the, um, the ways that we really hope to reach folks in all the pockets of our community is by identifying these leaders or sort of um, stakeholders that can help us to get into the different areas of our community that we've struggled to get into um, for any community engagement. Uh, but I absolutely agree with you. If we're not able to, to, to say who is responding to these, then in some ways, <laughs> you know, it, there are the same people that respond often to things and we need to be able to expand and and make sure that we're reaching, as you said, a broad swath of the community. So thank you for bringing that up. And it is absolutely very important to the committee to do that as well. And just to follow up, Maria, you said you were interested. Do you mean that you are interested in being involved in the process of the survey or you just were making that comment? It, it was more of a general comment on uh, on all surveys. I mean, I think it's I think getting the input of larger Amherst, broader Amherst on a, any number of different topics is extremely important. Um, and so I I was just feeling encouraged about the fact that you were uh, looking to to do that on at least this issue. So it was it was really a general yes, yes to asking people directly and yes to making sure you're reaching people. Great, okay, good. Are there any other questions on, on the African Heritage Reparation Assembly or the reparations work? All right. And Meg, I see your comment in the chat, so I'll definitely respond to that. <laughs> um, I think Meg was asking for the link. Um, so, but maybe that went direct to me. So yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So uh, a quick update on the rental registration work um, that 
that the council is looking at. So um, a group of sponsors came forward. I am one of those sponsors um, to put a um, permit fee structure in place. It's not a permanent permit fee structure. It's temporary um, until a new bylaw is established. And that has been referred to TSO. Um, TSO is having some really good conversations about that and um, will make a recommendation before it comes back to the council to be voted on. Um, I think the biggest sort of piece of feedback that I've been hearing and that TSO has been presenting when they're discussing this is how, so the proposal um, gives a discount to owner occupied landlords. Um, but some of the feedback we've been receiving is that there are landlords in the community. Um, they've lived here for many years and they may have a rental like a condo that they used to own. And should they, you know, also be entitled to some discount or should they fall into the category of a landlord who owns many units or is doesn't live in the town of Amherst. So I think that's something that that's that's being discussed further. Um, and then with respect to the bylaw itself, it has been referred to CRC. Um, and the chair of that committee has created a work plan um, that will give us the opportunity to work on it um, throughout the next several months and invite in folks from the community, whether they're experts, whether they're staff, whether they're um, residents who are interested. Um, so there will be a lot of opportunities for input there. Um, and I think this is something that is uh, really um, on people's minds and something that we hope we'll be able to have a full and robust discussion with our community about. Um, I think that was all I had for that. <laughs> so if there are any questions on that, we could pause. Um, Kath, yep. Yeah, no, I just wanted to make a comment. So um, uh, Kathleen Carroll's on and there, uh, we met a couple years ago, meaning the we then was Sarah Swartz and I um, with a neighborhood around Fisher and Harris where a lot of the homes, it, it's one of these tipping point neighborhoods where a lot of the homes are now rentals that weren't before. So part of this, we looking at the bylaw is saying, um, can we, when and how should we treat different properties differently based on um, they're well-maintained, uh, nothing ever goes wrong with them, the police are never called at the property, <laughs> the neighbors are happy with what's going on versus prob more problematic. Um, and then the second issue that we're hearing from is treating mega complexes, large investor owned ch chain like whole lots of units versus what you just said, Michelle, um, a, a resident who owns a few units or has a few. So trying to um, in, in addressing some concerns that neighborhoods have had, not paint everything with the, the same paintbrush. Um, so I think it's going to be important for people to stay tuned to this because it's really difficult. Um, and my, my own background from years ago uh, is the only thing I can draw in, and it's not particularly relevant, but when I was in the healthcare world and people were thinking nursing homes, there were some nursing homes where you really wanted them to be inspected somewhat frequently because they were regularly starving their, in the people who live there, bed sores for the people that, you know, whatever complaints versus others that you knew were operating. And they all were supposed to abide by the same standards, but just think differently about them if you know something. So try, that's where the council is and the CRC group and this exploration is going on. Can we strengthen what we have already on the books to be in a meaningful way. Um, so I, I think neighborhoods, um, we, we got um, emailed from two different neighborhoods and their groups forming that are concerned about what's happening to their neighborhood. And then there's neighborhood groups 
um, that are broader that have been working on this for a long time, that they know one of their recourses is to call the police. And that shouldn't be the only thing that happens if there are, are issues. So, so it's, it's opening up something that we realize is tricky, is I guess uh, uh, a real layperson's term on this. <laughs> Tricky also, you know, involves staff. And so right. the staff has to really be the, the people that administer the rental registration program, enforce the right. inspections and all of that. So there's a lot more that's being considered maybe than the meets the eye just to somebody, you know, looking into it, looking in on it. So yeah, absolutely. Okay, uh, Kath, did you, should we pass no, it over? Oh, yeah, I think we should just open it up for any right. other comments. You know, we see we had a better participation last first time, but last time we did it where we had a later afternoon slot, a three to five, and that one just turned out to not work this time. And then five to seven didn't work for several people who ended up actually not coming. Um, so we're going to try to... Uh, find a, the sweet spot for, for meeting times and topics, but we would definitely like to hear from D1, District 1 Neighborhood Association, but just any questions. Um, Kathleen, I think we you had emailed me about taxes and ARPA money, and we didn't put it on this agenda, but things for future meetings that you would like to hear um, or have us focus on this is a time for both hearing from Meg and, and what our neighborhood association has in work and for anyone else who's on the call. And Tony's hands up and Meg's hand is half up. <laughs> Meg, do you wanna do a quick donor report or do you wanna first sure. talk about future agenda? Either one, yeah. Either one, either way. You decide. Okay, do a quick donor. Okay. Um, this is, uh, thank you, Kathy, this is helpful. Uh, I'll be really quick. We have a bunch of exciting plans for this year for District 1 Neighborhood Association. Um, we've discovered that a lot of the things that people are concerned about are related to transportation and planning. So we're creating a, we're taking the planning committee that we had last year and expanding it. And we're creating a sub a transportation component of that planning. Uh, looking specifically at uh, speed, uh, calming speed, what is it, traffic calming, I think is the term, on Montague Road, Summer, and Pine Street, uh, looking at the possibility of a crosswalk at Pine and Harris. And uh, we're going to have a summer, uh, at, I hope, at the park, at the pavilion workshop for everybody to come with maps and kind of draw on them what they would like to see in terms of speed, traffic, and so on. And the, of course, the big kahuna issue is the main intersection uh, where there are five roads coming together. So we really want to get on top ahead of that because the town is going to make decisions and whether it includes public input will depend on how prepared we are. We're monitoring the library uh, project, uh, hoping very much that there will be uh, some North Amherst library presence during the construction. Uh, we're monitoring and pressuring really hard on the East Pleasant Street sidewalk, which we've been told two weeks ago that the survey is now happening, although I haven't seen any evidence of it, but we're really pushing for that. It's horrifying, especially in a snowstorm, to drive up East Pleasant Street and see the number of people who are walking basically inches away from the traffic because and buses letting people off into snowbanks because there's no sidewalk. John Gerber is leading a really cool project to create a nature trail that goes from the Renaissance Center and they've given us permission for parking. It goes east over to the agriculture, UMass Agricultural Learning Fields and Center with the beehives and the field, ex experimental fields and so on, down to Simple Gifts, along Simple Gifts across the street to Mill River and through uh, the Mill River trail system to Puffers and to Cushman, paralleling the uh, new history trail that I already mentioned. John has just taken this on and done a fantastic job working with David Zomek. And uh, so it'll, what it means too, is that while we await the East Pleasant Street sidewalk, there'll be a trail that'll kind of go up 
the, the, the pathway between North Pleasant Street and East Pleasant Street and get you to the Renaissance Center. So almost to where the sidewalk is. So the way of walking uptown from North Amherst that uh, doesn't require going on North Pleasant Street or the road. We're gonna have a whole bunch of uh, backyard parties this summer instead of big, huge, we'll probably have one barbecue, but we're gonna have, in order to meet more neighbors, we're gonna have what we're calling pop-up parties. And we have a, it'll include everything from voter registration to eating pizza and meeting each other and finding out um, what people's concerns are. Uh, we're also uh, having, hoping to have a session, which we may actually might wanna do this with Kathy and Michelle instead of us doing it is, so I'll, I'll suggest to, to, that we think of the best way to organize a district one uh, briefing and conversation about the impact on district one of the various zoning proposals that are being discussed, uh, whether they affect us or don't. They're mostly organized, developed around the downtown, but it'd be interesting to see what impact they're gonna have on district one. We're uh, also, doing some other things that are, I don't need to go into strengthening our, we're getting tax exempt status, strengthening our website. And uh, North Amherst is a, a designated historic town center. And we wanna get a sign that says that as you enter. So that people, so we're, we're trying to, we're very worried that uh, people in town not see the North, North Amherst as a part of town that we, uh, the purpose of which is to drive through as quickly as possible. Uh, but it's a place to, you know, stop and buy things and hike and recreate and so on. And not just a, uh, it's pretty stunning how huge the trucks are that ramble at very high speed up and down Montague Road and up and down Pine Street. Um, it's really amazing. So we're, we'd love to hear anybody's ideas of what you think we should be doing. And that's what we think we should be doing. <laughs> That was, that's think, what we're doing. No, it's yeah. so great how much you do as a community association. It's really wonderful. And we're we're very blessed to have Dona in our community doing all of this amazing and exciting and culturally, you know, relevant work. So thank you, Meg. Thank you. Um, we're thrilled to have such awesome counselors. <laughs> just just <Try>. one. <laughs> no, I, I echo what Michelle just said on the crosswalk, Michelle, uh, Michelle, Meg. Um, I know you're going to try to do a petition and get some signatures. Uh, you need to, once that's done, push hard at the TAC level, the Transportation Advisory Committee, to get it uh, sort of like rubber green stamped with a great idea, important, so that you can come with a resident proposal to JCPC and not be told that you should have gone to TAC first. Yeah, thank you, very good. <laughs> um, because, and, 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 you know, because it's the, the route in is really important and it's it could be financed at a pretty low level unless you're told, you know, you, you get, you're gonna get a price tag really high from DPW because somehow, it's more expensive when they hear about it in theory than when they do it in fact. Um, but, but it has died, just so you know, it has died twice before that crosswalk. Um, well, that's a good example of that is the, we wanted the smart light, which we got, we were told by DPW would be $250,000 and it turned out it was $50,000. Yeah, I'm just saying that this, uh, Nic Nicola brought this a while ago, that cr that exact crosswalk pre pre the, the existence of the council when it was still town meeting, but it just never went anywhere because it didn't have the oomph. So just going, I would just strongly advise going that, that route. Um, I wrote it down, thank you. <laughs> And Meg, before you got here, we talked about the survey and that that is under contract. And um, oh, according to Paul's uh, latest town manager report, it's going to be at least 12 weeks of a process. Um, but it, it sounds like it's underway. So good. Tony. And so Tony's got her hand up, too. So I didn't mean to jump in right away, Tony, but I oh, that's fine. No, it's actually a perfect segue because I was going to say that I have seen the survey guys out on East Pleasant okay. and there's some like paint at the end of my street with TOA. I imagine that's town of Amherst showing the property line. And so it's very exciting to see them there. 
I hope none of them get hit because they're right in the road <laughs> with their little, uh, you know, stands. So, um, but I, I just wanted to thank Michelle and Kathy for getting that to happen because it was a few years ago and Dona as well. Dona has really been very supportive about that. So I was one of the petitioners to get that survey funded and then it just, you know, sat in the shelf and nothing happened. So really thank you. Thank you to Meg and Michelle and Kathy for making that happen. So now the pressure is for the next step. How do we get the construction budgeted? Um, so whether that's a grant that needs to get written or whether it's money that needs to get earmarked in the JCPC plan, um, it'd be really great if Michelle and, and Kathy, both of you could keep that, keep the pressure on there. Cause I feel like the survey can happen and then you know, it'll be 10 years before anything gets talked about with construction. So, um, you know, money's just going to get tighter over the next few years when all these building project debt repayments start to fold you. So anything you can do to keep that front and center while the survey is fresh would be much appreciated. Thank you. You know, just Tony had a, a thought on that. Um, I agree, but I, uh, an example that we just got a payout from the state uh, for the poor state of our roads, because uh, our legislators brought it home, we need some payouts of state money for sidewalks. I mean, they're ex extremely expensive. So trying to think of where uh, we can work our state legislatures, what our priorities are and argue safety and pedestrian and green, you know, put it in this climate piece. I, I It's not just the East Pleasant Street road sidewalk but that's it's going to be a big issue because money is tight as an understatement on on what we've been looking at uh, as as uh, multiple claims on the same dollars um, so so I I think that's right trying to think larger and Meg as we you know the the intersection the unsafe intersection has stalled forever because unless we get a big state grant it's just not going to happen um, and so, uh, so we could build consensus about what we might want, and it it sits on a to be continued when money becomes available. <laughs> so, so well, I, I think they're building a ramp. They're building. Yeah, we just have to come up with a plan that we agree on and push for it. Oh no, and and a plan we agree on, and and then making sure that's the plan that's been submitted to the state. So I won't go. I won't go around the. We should be glad we didn't get the grant last time because it wasn't for what we thought it was for <laughs> up here in North Amherst. But in any case, um, but yes, um, and and I yep. think you know we're. Uh, I have to double check with um, Guilford DPW. The smart light was supposed to come with accounting capacity, C counting, not accounting, meaning counting trucks, cars, uh, people, and bicycles. So one of the things I've noticed, and I know uh, Jessica and others who haven't been on the phone, but in that intersection, there are more, period. So as COVID has gone away and the North Village, the Beacon apartments are now full and people are out and about, um, we're back to a traffic flow that was pre-COVID, but also I think more intense. And that was one of the issues why we didn't get the grant last time. You know, that the state coming out of Boston to take a look at our intersection, they said, you think this is a problem? <laughs> and they showed up during the summer and didn't see any backlogs and whatever, but you know, trying to make sure we get the counts and on the big trucks, I'd like to count on the big trucks. So I'm just going to find out if we can know those because they're, they're rooted through an area that is more congested than it used to be. Yeah. So any, we, we don't have a huge group here right now, but um, I would um, urge everyone to send in ideas, uh, issues. Um, the uh, Kathleen Carroll, who I saw logged off, she'd asked me about taxes and where they're going and where are we spending on the ARPA money? And I thought that's a larger discussion, but we could make, you know, the, what, how much money did the town get from ARPA and where are we spending it? We can put, we can make that an agenda item, but if anyone wants to send in others and we'll just come prepared, including we'll bring people in who can talk about it in a more um, informed way than 
perhaps we can. I know when Lynn and Pat held their district meeting, they brought in some town staff. So we, we can figure out what topics people would like to know more about and want to be partly a presentation, partly a discussion. Um, and Kath, what you mentioned a resident, Sam, um, that, that was going to bring. Sam McLeod, McLeod, if I say his name right, he is on the uh, Community Protect Preservation Act Committee, and he is an outreach. They've developed a website, a mm -hmm. Facebook page, but they would like to describe how to apply for a resident oh, proposal, right. you know, so not it's resident proposal is over at JCPC. This is just a proposal to CPAC and it has to fit in different categories, but they have an open period that'll be coming up opening in the summer. So they want to make sure they come out to district meetings and it can't, it, it has to fit, but it can be things like um, a playground area adding something for recreation or an open area that has no recreation. So recreation is one and it can be very small or larger um, and they don't get a lot of community based proposals. So Meg's squeak squeak squeaked its way in through a lot of work. A lot so, of work. Yeah, but we, we will feature that and we will try to do more advanced notice with probably a three to five Sunday slot unless we hear differently from people that seemed to be a better time slot. One of the things that I've been interested in is trying to find uh, ways to engage district one when it comes to voting days on, on voting days, um, I think that. Um, trying to sort of brainstorm and think about together ways that we can engage not only on voting days, but to sort of get people in the district more engaged overall um, in, in what's happening here. So um, that's something that I would like to find a way to talk about at some point. Sounds good. So I think we don't have to, we're down to a smaller and smaller group as people log off. So I think we could um, uh, say that we have finished the district one meeting for today. Do you think? Yes. Thank you for being here. Yeah. Thanks uh, thank everyone. You. Thank you all. Thank you. Yeah. Have, enjoy Everybody. the rest of your weekend. Bye. <laughs> bye bye. Um, Kath, I think it will stop recording um, when you get off, but it just can you just check it because I want to make sure that we okay. get it onto the cloud. So I, I go, up, do I click up and just do a stop? There's a yeah, little stop. See what happens if you do a stop recording.